morning, everyone. It's good to see all of you. It's encouraging to see you up and fellowshipping with one another and visiting people that maybe you haven't seen all week, just checking in on, hearing stories, praying for each other, hopefully. Um, I do have a few prayer requests that you could be praying for as a church uh, for your uh, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, many of you know our church clerk, Mildred Gla uh, Grassley. She was actually in the hospital earlier this week. I believe she had pneumonia. And uh, so uh, she's out now uh, recovering, I believe. And so, if, but if you would be praying for her, maybe think to check on her and her family, see how they're doing, if she needs anything. But please be in prayer that she continues to recover from that. Um, also, many of you may have already heard this, but uh, for the last couple of weeks, we've been praying for the Hawkins family. Uh, Lance Hawkins, uh, in the last couple of weeks, has lost his grandfather, grandmother, and then this past week, he lost his other grandmother, um, I believe, Reba Powell. He lost her, and uh, many of you here may know her, um, but uh, obviously, it's a very difficult time for Lance and his family, and so please continue to pray for them. I'm sure that they would appreciate you reaching out to them if you know them, to let them know that you're praying and, and offering your support in any way that you can, but uh, we, we definitely want to be lifting them up in prayer right now. Uh, but I know that there are those of you here that you may not know those people. Maybe you're visiting with us this morning or you've been coming for a few weeks and you want to get more involved. You want to meet more people, but you're not sure the way to do that. Um, these cards are connection cards. They're in the pews that are in front of you. I just want to encourage you to utilize these. If you have questions about our church, about things that you can be involved in, about activities or programs, that we do or what it means to be a member here or maybe what it means to become a Christian. Uh, these are an easy way for you to fill that out and put it in a box that's at each exit as you leave the sanctuary. I just want to encourage you to use these because they're available for that. A couple of announcements before we begin our worship is uh, this is going to be your last chance to sign up to have your pictures taken and be part of the church directory that's starting up. And so there are three days this upcoming week that they're taking pictures. There are only a few spots left to sign up to do that. And so if you have not done that yet, please do it immediately after service at the North Welcome Center, which is right over here. Uh, also at that North Welcome Center, you can sign up. We announced last week that we're going to be starting up home groups uh, here soon. And if you are interested in joining one of those home groups, uh, you need to sign up for them to let us know so that we can connect you with one of the home group leaders. And so the sign-up sheets are at the North Welcome Center right now. Next week we'll have one at the South Welcome Center as well. But uh, you need to sign up. And so that'll put your name, phone number, how we can get in contact with you, information about your family. And, uh, and we'll get you connected to a home group that's going to be starting up uh, very soon. Next Sunday morning, I know I have a lot of announcements. Summer's coming, guys, and there's a lot of activity that comes in the summertime. Uh, but next Sunday morning at 9 a.m., we are having Great Day in the Morning. That is for youth and their parents to come to. Uh, we are going to have food that's uh, being made for that. And so come at 9 a.m., come hungry. And I'm going to be sharing with you all the things that we are planning to do this summer which includes camp, it includes Bible studies, it includes vacation Bible school as well. All these different things that we do during the summer are going to be talked about there, and that's where you can actually register and sign up to help with those events. So that's for youth and their parents, May 2nd at 9 a.m. And then uh, just to let you all know of something that is coming, uh, we've had people asking about Sunday evening services, and we don't plan on starting those maybe until the fall. But what we are planning on doing throughout the summer is having what we're calling Sunday evening fellowships. Uh, it'll be happening twice a month uh, where we are just coming together as a church family on a Sunday evening together uh, and we'll be fellowshipping together. There'll be fun activities and things and games that we'll be doing that's just going to be in the, uh, the fellowship hall and outside and all those different things that we could just spend time together as a family. I think we've really missed that component of what it means to be a church, of having fellowship with one another. So that's mainly just to let you know it's coming. We'll have more details later. The first one of those that we'll be doing is May 23rd, Sunday, May 23rd, and then there'll be more throughout the summer. That was a lot, but now I'd like to start our worship uh, together this morning by reading from Psalm 8 and opening us in prayer. <clears throat> Psalm 8 it says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. 
When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is a man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we read this psalm and are reminded as we look to creation, the things that you have made, the stars, the sky, the heavens, but also things that are precious and small and fragile, like infants, babies. Lord, we, we look at these things and we, we can't but say, Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth that you have created all these things. Surely our God is worthy of all praise and honor and glory. There is no other creator, there is no other sustainer to this universe that we could come here that is worthy of our worship. And Lord, we are utterly amazed that these things that you have created, you would have entrusted to us, your creation, to have dominion over them, to care for them, to glorify your name, to be your image here on earth of all the beasts of the field, the oxen, all things that you have given to us to care for, Lord. But Father, we come here this morning absolutely acknowledging that as you have entrusted those things to our care, Father, we have woefully corrupted this creation through our sin. And that we have failed in our task to have dominion exercising your oversight and using your creation, bringing you glory, extending it to the ends of the earth. And so thanks be to God that Christ, the better man, has come. And God, you have given dominion and glory and authority to him over all things. And you have subjected all things under his feet so that he now sits on your throne as the perfect man redeeming our curse and making us right with you and bringing creation back into your authority and subjection, Father. You have, you have sent your Son to clean up our mess and in doing so only made yourself even more worthy of all of our glory and praise and adoration. And so, Father, I pray that this morning as we come to you that we would indeed do that. Lord, that we would praise you as worthy because you are, that we would love you and worship you because you are worthy of our worship, of our love, and our adoration. So, Lord, would you affect our hearts to that end this morning. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and let's lift high the name of Jesus. He is our King. He is our Lord. And he is light of the world. Lift high the name of Jesus, of Jesus, our King. Make known the power of His grace, the beauty of His peace. Remember how His mercy reached, and we cried out to Him. Lifted us to solid ground, to freedom from our sin. Oh, sing, my soul, and tell, oh, He's done, till the earth and heavens are filled with His glory. Lift high the name of Jesus, of Jesus our Lord. His power in us is greater than, is greater than this world. To share the reason. 
listen for our hope to serve with love and grace that all who see him shine through us might bring the father praise oh sing my soul and tell all he's done till the earth and heavens are filled with his glory Lift high the name of Jesus, of Jesus, our light. No other name on earth can save, can raise a soul to life. He opens up our eyes to see the harvest he has grown. We labor in his fields of grace as he leads sinners home. Oh, sing my soul and tell all he's done till the earth and heavens are filled with his glory. Heavens are filled with his glory. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to read with you from 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, verses 3 through 9. And uh, Peter writes this. <clears throat> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let's pray to the one that we have not seen, but we love. Let's pray together. Our Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, Son of Man, we have not seen you with our eyes, we have not handled you with our hands, and yet, we know you through the word of God, which reveals you, Lord Jesus. We thank you that though you were in the form of God, you did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made yourself nothing, being born in the likeness of frail human flesh. You were obedient where we should have been obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And therefore, the God the Father has highly exalted you that at your name, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that you are the Lord, the King, and the Supreme Master of all things. We pray, Lord Jesus, this morning that though we do not see you, you would create love in our hearts for you. That though by nature, and because of Adam's fall, we are full of unbelief and rebellion. You would create faith in our hearts to look to you for everything in this life and the next. We pray that though in Adam's situation, we have reason to be sad and despairing. In you, we have reason to rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. 
as we hear the preached word and as we sing this song, as we pray to you, we pray that you would open our ears to hear your word and open our mouths to sing your praise. In your name's sake, we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing. our hope in life and death Christ alone Christ alone what is our only confidence that our souls in him belong who holds our days within his hand what comes apart from his command and what will keep us to the end, the love of Christ in which we stand. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess. Christ, our hope in life and death. What truth can calm a troubled soul? God is good. God is good. Where is His grace and goodness known? In our grave, Redeemer's blood, who holds our faith when fears arise, who stands above the stormy trial, who sends the waves that bring us nigh unto the shore, the rock of Christ. Christ, our hope in life and death. Unto the grave, what will we say? Christ, He lives. Christ, He lives. And what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with Him. And when we rise to meet the Lord, then sin and death will be destroyed. And we will feast in endless joy when Christ is all. eternal oh sing hallelujah now and ever we confess christ our hope in life and death oh sing hallelujah our hope springs eternal oh sing hallelujah now and ever Christ, our hope in life and death, now forever we confess, Christ, our hope in life and death. Amen. You may be seen. Good morning. It's good to see all of you this morning. Ephesians chapter 2 is where we'll be. 
If you want to take out your Bible and turn there, there should be a Bible in front of you if you don't have one in the pew rack there. You can take that and use that. If you don't have a Bible, take it home with you, and that can become yours. So feel free to do that. Ephesians chapter 2. We really are entering some amazing passages as we get into this. And uh, in my studies this week, I was really <clears throat> thinking what would be best would maybe be to give you some sermons to listen to this week. Uh, there's a lot of people who do a lot better than me uh, in preaching these, uh, these passages. But for some reason, God has worked it out where I'm the one here. I'm the pastor here, and I get to be the one to preach it. Uh, but there are a lot of good messages out there on Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, I could give you, I guess, a bunch of names, but I'm not, I'm not going to do that. But I encourage you maybe to seek that out. It really is a blessing. I'll share with you what I, what I think is I plan this morning to share with you the best news ever given. Really, I do. Uh, the best thing that has ever been said or done in the history of mankind, I plan to share that with you this morning. You're not going to hear it anywhere else other than in, hopefully, local churches. Uh, and, but to get there can be uh, a little difficult. Uh, can be difficult maybe even to understand. Because I really only plan this morning to look at the first three verses of chapter, of chapter 2. We're going to read a little bit more. Uh, but it can be difficult of what will be uh, said, but it, it need not be, because it what, it's what leads then to the best news. And without understanding what we'll look at this morning, uh, the best news isn't the best news. It's just news. It's just something. Follow along with me. Uh, I'm going to read the first 10 verses of chapter 2, but like I said, we're not going to get through it all uh, today. We will over the next few weeks. <clears throat> it says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Youth, I would encourage you to pay attention in the next few weeks because this is uh, what will be preached at youth camp as well in June. This will be our passages, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Pastor Scott will be preaching them, uh, but it will help you, as you know, throughout the week with Quiz Bowl and different things. Maybe memorize this. might be helpful to you uh, as well. I think you just went through it in Sunday school also, and so there's no excuses to get anything wrong at youth camp uh, this year. Uh, I'm just warning you ahead of time. What Paul just did is he, in chapter 1, he kind of wrapped up speaking this just grand thing that we, that we looked at together, and really what we see is in chapter 1, Paul introduces us to God. But now as we get to chapter 2, he introduces us to humanity. Uh, it really is, like I said, I think it can be a dreadful task to preach the passage that I have to preach this morning because of how it's took, because of what we are going to hear. As we learn about humanity, you really learn some difficult truths about ourselves, about the people that we come in contact with, about the people that we love. But it is true, and I don't want to say a dreadful task in saying I don't want to preach this passage, but a dreadful task in how it's perceived oftentimes, because this is very important for us to get and to understand. The reason I say dreadful is because oftentimes when I talk to different people at our church, whether it's uh, guests or uh, members or people who've been with us for a really long time, 
Recently, probably the biggest complaint that I get about our services is people will say something like, we need to make it more lively. We, we need to pep it, pep it up a little bit, maybe is what we say. You know, we get a little pep in our step. We, we need something like that. Maybe, maybe give us a message uh, about the issues of today. You know, speak to those issues and tell us then what the, what the Bible has to say about that. Or maybe in the summer we could do a fun sermon series on different movies that are out and the theology that would, in, you know, would uh, integrate with these movies. And you could talk about that. That'd be very relevant and, and it would help us as we, as we leave and as we go out of there. And it's hard for me when I hear that, if I'm being quite honest. I understand where people are coming from. It's very depressing out there in our world today. Not too much to look forward to, or they'll say, they'll tell us, you know, well, in six weeks, it'll be more normal, and we get our hopes up, and we find out that's not true. We got another six weeks, and another six weeks, another eight weeks, and it's really dreadful. You know, we have a lot of things going on within our community with deaths recently, with COVID, and so I understand the desire to want to come to church with the hopes that when we leave this place, we feel great. I get that desire. But it shows me, when I feel that way as well, it shows me a problem within myself, and I think it shows me a problem within our, within our church culture in general, that we really seem to fail to grasp what really is the main problem in humanity. What, what really is the reason why we walk through these doors on Sunday morning. We have a failure, I think, oftentimes to understand who we are and what God has done. To really get a grasp of what has taken place, what God has given us in his word, what has happened in the person of Jesus Christ. I think it's a failure that we struggle with to realize that when we walk into this room together corporately, we come in here to worship God, not me, not you. I don't come in here this morning. I, I, that's a lie, because this does happen. But I shouldn't come in here ever to please you. And you shouldn't come in here to please me. Now, don't get me wrong. That's part of it. That's part of being a church. We love each other. We encourage each other. We care for one another. That happens on Sunday morning. At least it should. It needs to be. You know, we, just, we mentioned how uh, Lance Hoggins, he's lost three grandparents in a week and a half. We need to love him and care for him greatly. And that should be part of, of what we do. But when we gather on Sunday morning, we are here to worship the Lord, to praise him for what he has done. And this is the job of the, of the church. The job of the church is to, to worship God and not just that, but we worship God, and then we tell the world the only message that we have to tell them. And the message that we have to tell them is this. It's, it's not always a pretty one, but it's this. You need to repent and fall on your face before a holy God. Now, oftentimes, that's pushed aside. Oftentimes, uh, when we say that to people, they're going to say, no, I'm not interested in that. And there's many different reasons for that. But as Christians, as a church specifically, that really is the only message that we have. You need to repent before God because why? He's a wrathful God. He's a wrathful God against sin. And the fact is, you sin. I sin. We are sinners. And so we have to remember that as the church, as we approach everything in our culture, I think it was uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones who said this in his sermon uh, on, a, on this passage, but he said, we can't allow culture to dictate what we preach and what we teach. It always has to start at the gospel message, and everything flows first through that, not the other way around. So we don't take a movie and watch it and then say, how can this conform to my theology? No. That's not what the church does. Sadly, you'll see that. A lot of churches do that. That's their sermon series. That's what they focus on, these cultural issues. And again, I'm not saying it's bad to engage in cultural things, but when we gather as the church to do the job of the church, our focus is on the one big problem, and that is sin. 
that is sinners who need to repent before a holy God. And Paul would say in the passage that we are looking at, and you once was that. Now, as a church family, those of us who've been saved by God's grace, as we go through these first three verses, I want you to remember this as we go through them. This is what describes you. It's not what describes you any longer. And we'll get to that by the end of the message. But as we go through this, you realize that you have been saved from this by a holy God when you didn't deserve it. But there's a lot of people today still walking around who have not been saved by God. Maybe, maybe some in here this morning. And so when we go through the first three verses, if you haven't trusted by faith in Jesus Christ, these first three verses that we're going to look at in depth today, it describes you. You say, well, are you trying to scare them? You should be scared, really, as we go through it. That, that should be a normal response, to be very nervous and scared of what this is describing as, as me apart from God. But like I said, I also have the best news ever to share with you. And so we will, we will get there, I promise. The first three verses tell us about humanity, and it talks about sin, and it talks about it really in three different areas. The first thing when talking about our sin, it says, following the course of this world. Following the course of this world. I put in parentheses next to this, a sin nature. All humans are sinners. We see that in the Bible. We can find that in many different places. It is what we do, and we seem to do it very well. We seem to be good at it. Besides Jesus Christ himself, there has never been anyone to walk the face of this earth or be on this earth who was not in sin, who did not sin. It's just something, it's just something that we cannot overcome. Many of parent has been so frustrated because you have tried your best best to train your child to not be a sinner, and what do they do all the time? They sin, and it's so frustrating because you say, it is easy. Don't do, don't do, don't do, 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 do. Just do that. But they don't. But maybe you've experienced that in your own life as well. You leave church on a Sunday morning. Pastor said, I should do this if I want to obey Christ. And by Sunday afternoon, you failed to do this. And you're frustrated with yourself. Why? Because you realize, hopefully in that moment, you are a sinner. And no amount of training, no amount of anything that you can put yourself to will make you accomplish the task of overcoming sin. Think about, think about the great feats in humanity that people can do. Look at our military and the, and the training that they put our men and women who are in the military, that they put them through to be able to accomplish just some amazing things. They train men and women to be able to be tortured and just go with it. That's, that is amazing to me. That's why I'm not in the military. That, I, you couldn't train me to do that. I'd be like, yeah, they're over there. I mean, that's just what would happen because pain isn't fun. But we actually have the ability to train people to do that, to keep their mouths shut when they are being put through a ton of pain. We, we've trained people to go without sleep and to keep going and going and going. You can train people in education to be able to build massive structures and buildings. There's, there's all kinds of great things mankind can do with some training. But one thing we've never been able to overcome is sin. So many people have tried. They've tried to follow the Bible word for word. They've tried to keep it the best that they can. Maybe that is you in your life, but you find out, don't you? You can't do it. It doesn't work. You cannot train yourself enough to not sin. So sin just simply cannot be overcome by anybody. Why is that? Well, because the Bible tells us in our sin we are dead. And just a fact of the matter is a dead person cannot overcome anything. A, a dead person can do nothing for themselves. Why? Because they're dead. I don't think I need to explain that much farther. It makes complete sense when we think of it that way. Our first father, Adam, to put it simply, failed us. 
He failed us. He failed me. He failed you. He failed himself. He failed his family because he chose to sin. He chose to put himself before God. And on him hangs our lack of hope. He failed to follow follow the Father's will. He chose to listen to Satan. He chose to follow his fleshly desires. And as a result of that, he died. And when we think about it in that way, what we then need as a human race is we need someone who can reverse this. We need, we need somebody who will obey the Father. We need somebody who will humble themselves to their own passions, their own fleshly desires, and be obedient to God. We need somebody who can overcome death, whatever that might look like. We need somebody to show us that this can be done. And if you sit here today in your sin and you've never trusted in, in Christ, I hope you realize this morning you're not this person because you, you've failed most of this list already probably in your life. You weren't able to obey the Father. You very rarely humble yourselves and don't give in to your passions and the things that are sinful. We need somebody to do this for us. Well, Paul doesn't just talk about following the course of this world. He takes it a step, a step further. Verse 2, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. Now, when we see that phrase, we know that Paul is speaking of Satan here. And again, in parentheses, the first one was our sin nature. In parentheses here, I put, we follow our master. That's what we do. Paul points out that sinners have a master. And the master that they have is Satan himself. Jesus actually states this uh, very clearly uh, to the Pharisees and Sadducees in John chapter 8, verse 42 through 47. It says, Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. This is describing the sinner. It's not comfortable for us to hear, but it is the truth. We want to believe, maybe you're sitting here today, and and you want to believe that you are free to choose and do as you wish all the time. But yet the Bible tells us something drastically different. It says, hey, you don't get to choose what you want to do. You are a slave to sin and to your master, Satan, and you actually do the things he tells you to do. That's what you do. That's who you are. That's what Jesus would say to this very intellectual and religious group of Pharisees. Can you imagine them hearing that? They've devoted their whole life to Scripture. They give all the ties. They go and they teach. They've done all the, everything that they're supposed to do all the time. And this guy who's supposed to be the Messiah looks them in the face and says, do you want to know who your father is? Satan. What? What? But it's the same message for us this morning, apart from Christ. You don't do what you want to do. You are actually a slave to sin. Earlier in John chapter 8, just a few verses before what I read, uh, Jesus would speak to them and it says, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. When you're a slave to that sin, sin is your master and you cannot overcome it. Again, you just, I've talked about this. You can't simply just choose, hey, I'm going to overcome sin today. 
doesn't work that way. The reason why, you are actually a slave to it. Sin isn't just your friend that comes along and you say, I'm not going to associate with you, you know, or this thing over there that you don't really like, but every once in a while you'll do something with it. That's not what sin is. Sin is your master, and it directs you. But in thinking about that and in seeing that, I think the fair question would be, and maybe you're thinking this because I do as well, the natural fair question then is, why in the world am I held responsible then for my sin? If, if Satan is the master over it, and he, I'm just a slave to sin, and there's really nothing that I can do otherwise, then why would I be held responsible for my sin? I mean, maybe it should go to Adam. Maybe I should just throw it all on him. It's his fault anyways. Or maybe I should throw it on my parents. They, they taught me how to sin. Or maybe I should throw it on media or something. But it, it definitely looks like it shouldn't be thrown on me. But Paul speaks to that in verse 3. He says, Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. You notice the phrase in there, living in the passions of the flesh. My answer to you that I think Scripture would speak to is if you, were the, if you were to sit here and say, well, then I cannot be held responsible for my sin. How can you tell me that I am at fault in my sin? This is why. You love it. You love it. You love every second of your sin. That is the passions of your flesh. You, you desire it. You, you actually think about it. You, you plan for it, of how it can happen, of, of how it can be done. You, you will bait people into situations so that you can just sin. You say, Pastor Tim, I have no idea what you're talking about. I guarantee you do. I guarantee if you're married, you've baited your spouse before just so you could yell at them. You've set up a situation in a scenario to say, let's see what they do. I know what they're going to do. They're not going to put the dish away, but we're going to find out if they're going to put the dish away. Three days later, the dish is still there. And what do you do? You yell at them. What did you do that for? Oh, that's passions, evil desires of your heart. And you just got so happy over it. But it's sin. It's sin. Even those of us in this room today who I said remember this doesn't describe you. This describes who we once were. We still, we still fall to this. We still fall to this. Every time in our life that we choose to sin, and I said that the right way, we choose to sin every single time. What we do is we say, God, excuse me, you're in my seat. Could you get down from there and let me sit there? I have a better idea. I have a better plan. I, I have a better strategy. My body tells me I want to do that, and I'm going to do it. I'm God today. I'm the one that's most important today. This is what happens when we sin. We place ourselves on the throne, and we just love being on the throne. We love us some us. It's something that we fight, even as Christians. I think you would agree. Every day. It's a battle that we face. And as we grow in our faith more and more, I think we see the depths of that struggle in our heart more and more and more, don't we? It becomes more real to us because we realize how much we love ourselves and how difficult it is, first of all, to love God more than I love myself, but then next, it becomes really difficult to love everybody else more than myself. I mean, if I struggle with loving God more than Tim, you stand no chance. My family doesn't stand much of a chance. But we see the truth of God's word here of what Paul said, right? Who once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of of our body. So we don't only have a sin nature. We don't only find ourselves slaves to sin and being ruled by our master Satan, but we find out, I actually 
really like the situation I'm in. That's one of the things that I laugh at. I hear Christians say this all the time. They see somebody who's rich or something on TV, and we love to say, yeah, but they're miserable. Are they? Are they really miserable? I mean, I don't know if, I mean, sometimes, yeah, probably, but I don't know if that's always the case because sinners love them some sin. Uh, They probably really enjoy the life that they are living. They probably are excited to go to the next show or the next party or the next this or the next that. They're probably kind of looking forward to it. And we find ourselves oftentimes in the same thing. But this leads to the scary truth of what the end of verse 3 says. It says, And we're by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. We see evidence of this wrath of God happening, I think, even presently. The wrath of God is not something that we should shy away from. It's not something that we should be scared to share with, being afraid that people will say, well, a loving God isn't that way. It's the truth of God. It's part of his character. It's what shows us his justice, actually, that he has wrath. And he's actually been kind enough to us to tell us he has this wrath on sinners, But I think we see evidence of it, like I said. I'm not going to read this, but you can read Romans chapter 1, uh, verse 18 through 32. It, It shows us how in our sin, it often leads to deeper and deeper sin and into sin. We, we see that with the passages, right? We'll give them over to the lust of their heart and the flesh. And we see a lot of uh, uh, sinful sexual behavior there in Romans that will happen. And it's really stuff that we see today. It's stuff that we see happening today within our, within our own society. And as Christians, you know, we can sit back and be appalled by it. But really what it is, is it's the wrath of God being poured out on sinners. He is allowing them to be overcome by their sin of which they love. And you see that stair-step progression that happens. It was really funny. I was listening to a pastor from the 50s preaching a message on this, on this passage. And when he, when he talked about the wrath of God, he said, of which we obviously see evidence God is pouring out his wrath because look how bad society is today. Now, when I talk to some of you, the 50s were the golden age. Uh, There was no sin in the 50s. Everybody went to church. Everybody did everything. But this pastor seemed to think the wrath of God was just obvious and evident then. Well, we're 70 years removed from that. Deeper and deeper in the pit. And we see it. This is God allowing his wrath to be shown as people drift farther and farther from God each passing year. Now, I wish that I could say that that's only evident outside the walls of the church, but we do see, sadly, within the church, this is happening today. The youth, I think, just started a series on Wednesday nights, like an apologetics thing. But one of the things that they're going to get to, I don't think that they got to it yet. Pastor Scott was saying, I don't know if you guys have heard about this, these deconversion stories that people are doing. It's all over the place. And it's it's former Christians or, or Christians, they would call themselves, I don't know. But they, want, they don't want to share their testimony. They want to share their deconversion story to how they realize this Christian faith is actually all a lie. Or when they realize that the Christian faith that they were grown to believe of the Bible actually isn't true, that God is love, God is harmony, God is, God is peace, God loves all people, God will unite all people. And they, they walk you through the deconversion story and it has the same five to seven steps, all of them, all together. But it's all, always leading away from God. It's always going away from God. And this has infiltrated the church very greatly. And it has a big impact on people. Because, like we talked about in chapter 1, they don't really know God. They know about him as a feeling. They know about him as an emotion. And they're not feeling that. Therefore, it can't be right. It can't be true. It can't be real. They don't, they don't really have a firm grasp on theology, doctrine, and the truths of God and who he is. And so that's why we see these things. And so to think that the wrath of God we just see outside the walls, I just want to warn us of that because that's, that's not true. We see it in the walls too, where there's a lack of true belief. 
So we see evidence of the wrath of God now, but we also know that there's a wrath of God to come. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 28 to 31, it says, Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I think this is a warning that people need to hear. It's not something that we need to shy away from. Again, if you're here this morning, you've never trusted in Christ, please hear this warning. God is a vengeful God. He says, I will repay. You have sinned against me, your creator, your maker, and I have the last word. That's a scary thought. That's a scary thought to people lost in their sins. But again, the problem is, they're dead. And dead people don't hear a thing. You can scream at them. You can kick them. You can push them. You can pull them. You can do whatever you want. But that dead person will not listen. They will not be changed. This morning, I have no doubt, I am preaching to some dead people. In one ear, out the other, right over the head, don't really care, maybe, what is being said or what you are hearing. And that's your choice. That's your choice. But I pray and I hope that that isn't always true. Because when we think about that, we fall in line with the disciples in Matthew chapter 19, verse 25, after Jesus has his dealing with the rich ruler and all that, he says how hard it is for a rich person to be saved. The disciples ask him, because it says they were greatly astonished, saying, well then, who, who can be saved? And I think after everything that I've said this morning, that really should be the question. Pastor Tim, you're telling me, if I'm separated from Christ, but I'm, I'm dead, I can't do anything about it, what good news is that? Because you told me, you told me you were going to share with me the best news ever this morning. And so now what, I, what you're telling me is I'm sitting here and you've just told me I have the wrath of God getting ready to be poured out on me because I'm a sinner and I'm dead and there's nothing I can do about it. Thanks. Thanks. Let's go. I would agree with you. That's actually horrible news. I have to wonder what the disciples thought when Jesus finally spoke up because they asked him this question, who then can be saved? And in the next verse, it says, but Jesus looked at, looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. So again, your heart is racing. This is impossible with man. Well, I, I'm a man. So I have no hope. I mean, there's nothing there. What do I do? Just go home. Wait for the day of destruction. Hope it's not as bad as we think. No. The same two words that Paul would pen for us at the beginning of verse 4 are the same words that Jesus would say to the disciples in this moment. And I stand here today thinking that this is the greatest two words ever said. The greatest two words to ever be uttered in any literature or on the lips of any person because when you hear everything that I've said this morning, I hope you feel utter hopelessness and helplessness. Because that is where you stand. But to God. That's the difference. The two best words ever penned in anything is found in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God. Yeah, you sit here dead. You sit here actually completely Hopeless. But God stepped in. But God steps in. Because where you can't do, God does. God has done it for you. 
This morning, there's many people in this room who have sang the song, this is my story, this is my song. You, you know what I'm talking about. Our story, our song, is but God. I sat there hopeless. I sat there helpless. I sat there a sinner, the worst of sinners, loving myself more than anybody all the time. I had no hope. I, I couldn't do anything. But my story goes like this. But God stepped in. But God changed that. Of all the things that we could discuss from the pulpit, there is nothing as important as these two words, but God. Until there is a realization that God must first move in a person's life before change can actually happen, then all of our attempts to change people are useless and a complete waste of time. Please hear that. We can strive as a church, you can strive as a Christian to do all kinds of good things, and that is fine. We can say our goal as a church is to end abortion, okay? Our goal is to stop human trafficking. We want to try to end wars altogether. Our goal as a church is we want to promote peace. We want to feed the hungry. We want to shelter the homeless. We want to encourage people to vote. We want to fight for our country. We think that is good. And whatever else you might say to me, Pastor, this would be a good thing to promote from the pulpit. I have to tell you, it's all useless and a waste of time if we do not make it first and foremost our priority to tell people, but God. It's a waste of time. You can go to the Capitol and you can tell all the congressmen and everybody that abortion is horrible. Listen, dead people don't hear you. Dead people don't hear you. You can be completely appalled by the things that you see in this world. You should be, but it shouldn't surprise you because sinners love themselves some sin. That's what they like. That's what they do. And unless God steps in in their life and wakes them up, no, not wake them up, gives them life. Unless God steps in and gives them life, there will be no change. There will be nothing different. We could hand out food until our, until our fingers fall off, until everybody in Monroe County has so much food, but there's a problem. The problem isn't that they're hungry. The problem is that they're sinners. Our government can keep handing out money. It's kind of nice, actually. I keep getting it. I just keep getting it. It's great. It's not going to solve any problems. Because our problems isn't finances. Our problem isn't relationships with other countries. Our, our problem isn't COVID. Our problem is sin. And all those people who are lost in their sin are dead. They are completely dead. And there is only one organization, if you want to call it. There is only one group of people in this world who can help this world solve the problem with the message that they've been given. And it's us. It's the church. And the answer isn't political. The answer isn't financial. The answer is, but God stepped in. And he can change your heart. But here's just the truth. Most of the time, they're not going to listen. Listen. Most of the time, they're not care, going to care. There's not going to be some Christian utopia society that we can go to and just be at peace with God and with everybody because of sin. Because of sin. It really makes me think of the story of Lazarus. I don't want to dwell on it too long, but I do want to read a quote from George Whitfield, who was an evangelist, revival guy, ways back. But you know the story of Lazarus. It was Jesus' friend. He got word that Lazarus was sick. He said, yeah, I'll go and see him. People were expecting him to go to heal his friend. But then when Jesus finally said, you know what, I'm going to go over there to Bethany, they're like, he's already dead. There's no point. Jesus says, no, I'm still going to go. And he, goes, he still goes, and he makes the trip. And he's met by Lazarus' sister, who says he's dead. But she shows a little faith in saying, but I know who you are. I know what you can do. And he, he goes into town and he, the Bible even tells us that he's, he weeps 
because this is somebody that he loved. It was a good friend of his. And just like you and I who've done this before, Jesus stands in front of a tomb of his friend who's been dead at this point for four days. He's been dead for four days. The Bible tells us that he, Jesus ends up raising Lazarus from the dead, and it's really an interesting story because the sister's like, you know, he really stinks by now. We probably shouldn't roll the stone away because we're all going to smell that, and it's kind of gross. And you think about the emotional ramifications, too, of that. That's his sister. I don't want to see my brother like that. I know he died, but I don't want to see that. I don't want to smell that. I don't, I don't want to have to go through this. Let's not do this. But yet Jesus, in his great power and his great might, he tells Lazarus to come forward, and Lazarus walks out of that tomb. Now, some may say Lazarus chose to do that. I would call those people, uh, what's the right word? Uh, ignorant, maybe? That's not what I would call them, really, but I'm standing here. Uh, you might say Lazarus tried with all his might, and that's how he walked out. But I tend to think that dead men don't walk out of tombs, except for when Jesus calls them. George Whitfield put it this way. He's much more eloquent than me in talking about sinners. He says, Come ye dead, Christless, unconverted sinners. Come and see the place where they laid the body of the deceased Lazarus. Behold him laid out, bound hand and foot with grave cloths, locked up and stinking in a dark cave with a great stone placed on top of it. View him again and again. Go nearer to him. Be not afraid. Smell him. Ah, how he stinketh. Was he bound hand and foot with grave cloths? So art thou bound hand and foot with thy corruption. And as a stone was laid on the sepulcher, so is there a stone of unbelief upon thine stupid heart. Perhaps thou hast lain in this state, not only for four days, but many years, stinking in God's nostrils. And what is still more affecting, thou art as unable to raise thyself out of this loathsome dead state to a life of righteousness and true holiness as ever Lazarus was to raise himself from the cave in which he lay so long. Thou mayest try the power of thine own boasted free will and the force and energy of moral persuasion and rational arguments, which without all doubt have their proper place in religion. But all thy efforts, exerted with never so much vigor, will prove fruitless and abortive till that same Jesus who said, Take away the stone, and cried, Lazarus, come forth, also quickens you. For many of us today, we're thankful that one day you heard that. You heard Jesus. You heard him say, Hey, Get out of that tomb. You don't belong there. You don't belong there. You're mine. You're part of my family. I will save you. I will cleanse you white as snow. Come and be alive. Come and have life more abundantly. No longer slave to sin. No longer your master is Satan. No longer does your forefather Adam hang over your head. No, no, no. I'm the new Adam. Come to me. I never sinned. Oh, I died, but I conquered it because I'm alive again. Aren't you thankful that you heard that? I believe for some of us this morning, maybe you're hearing that for the very first time. You're sitting here in your sin. You're sitting here in your stink. You're sitting here in your filth. And you're thinking you just heard the worst message ever because you feel horrible. But yet then we talk about this Lazarus story, we talk about this but God thing, and all of a sudden in your heart you are hearing for the very first time, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. It's time for you to come out of that grave and live life in me. Would you by faith believe that this morning? By faith would you believe that? Now to me from where I stand, if God is calling in your heart and you say no, that sounds about as dumb to me as Lazarus saying no. Just, just being honest with you. Lazarus busted out of that tomb. 
Life again? Let's do it. For you, it'd be life for the first time. Free from your sin, free from your guilt, free from your shame. Not because of anything you do, but because God stepped in. Because verse 4 says, but God. I hope that's true in your life today. I hope it's real. I hope that this really is the best news you've ever heard. I hope that when you walk out of this room, you can say, it was the most electrifying, exciting thing I've ever been to. Why? But God, oh, the music stunk. I mean, Pastor Tim stumbled over so many things. But when we looked at verse 4, compared to verses 1 through 3, you got to be kidding me that that's real. This is the best thing I've ever heard. You need to hear it. You need to be a part of this. You, you've got to understand what's going on. You've got to know who you are, but what God has done and who you can be in him. I really can't think of anything better to say. <laughs> I really can't think of a, of a better task, and I, and I mean that when I say that. If we could feed everybody in the world, it wouldn't be better than this news. And so I hope you take it to heart. I hope it's true for you. I hope you praise him daily because he showed up in your life. And I hope for some of you this morning, you're surrendering to him, your life, your all, because you know and realize for the very first time he is your Savior, the one to give you life from death. Let's bow together. Let's pray this morning, and we'll sing a song here in a little bit, give you a chance to respond to the word of God. God, it really is uncomfortable, and you, you know my heart, and so it's silly to hide it. It's uncomfortable to preach sermons on sin. One, because I'm a sinner. So I feel like a hypocrite. The other reason is I just know people don't want to hear that. I don't want to sit and listen to how bad I am all the time. I don't want to be around people who constantly show me my faults each and every day, all the time. So God, I can understand that coming to church, we don't want that. We want to feel good. We want to worship and praise you. We want to leave being excited about what you're doing. So God, as we approach a passage like this, I know in my heart it can sink a little just thinking, oh, service might be a downer. God, I pray that we would grasp the reality of how big verse 4, those two words are, but God in comparison to those first three verses. God, that should cause us to be so thankful, so excited about who you are and what you're doing, no matter what we're going through in our life, no matter how difficult it may be, but to understand that we are yours and you are mine, that, that wipes all that stuff away. It doesn't negate how bad it hurts or whatever's going on. God, it helps me put it into perspective that you will never let me go, that you raised me from a dead life, slave to sin, serving my master Satan, but yet you would bring life from death. So God, I know there's many of us today who can praise you for that, and I pray that we would. I pray that we would adequately praise you with our life, giving you our everything. I like Romans 12 tells us where we're no longer slaves to sin, but we become bond servants of you. We want to do everything you would have for us. So God, I pray that we would do that. But God, I, I pray for those this morning who are wrestling in their sin. They, they know they're separated from you. They know that your wrath will be poured out on them if they would die today. They know they live with no hope in themselves. God, I pray that you would help them to see the truth of your word that you have stepped in. And as verse 4 goes on to say, that you're rich in mercy, that you love them, and that by your grace, you save them. God, I pray that they wouldn't hold back today, that they would do that by faith, just believe in you, trust in you. And God, we know that you accomplish your work in their life when that happens. So God, we thank you for the truth of this word. I'm thankful that you stepped in. I'm thank you for those two words, but God, that without that, we're hopeless. But with it, 
we gain absolutely everything. So God, we praise you now with this song. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Sing. Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. We constantly roam What Father so tender Is calling us home He welcomes the weakest The vilest, the poor Our sins, they are many His mercy is more Praise the Lord His mercy is more of kindness he lavished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cost we stood neath a debt we could never afford our sins they are many his mercy is more sins they are many his mercy is more so listen to this real quick if today was heavy and difficult next Sunday but God being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. That's next week. So I hope you come back, unless you just like being beaten and you just want to come to this week and hear how bad we are. But this is the good news. And so we'll share this next week. I look forward to it. Let's pray, and then we'll be dismissed. God, I am thankful that it's not just one ver verses 1 through 3 but we read all the way down to verse 10 and see the great joys that you have saved us, that you've made us a part of the body of Christ, that you have immeasurable riches for us, that you've, that you've saved us not to just do it, nothing either, but you've, you've given us work, you've given us tasks to do in your kingdom for you. God, you are a good God. We deserve to stay 
in our death and in our sin. But then you stepped in and intervened and gave us life, a purpose, hope, joy, and peace that is everlasting. God, we thank you for that. Help us to portray that. Help us to live that out. Help us as a church family to love each other how we should because you have told us that is how they will know that you are my disciples, how you love each other. And so God, as we're united in Christ, as we're united together in the things that you have done for us, help us to serve you. Help us to serve each other this week very faithfully. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's dismiss from our end sections again this morning.